Well, hello everyone. Good afternoon and welcome back. Hey, it's, uh, it's great to have you back. We're here today for, for day four of our um, journey back into nature. And with that, we again wanted to thank you for joining us. It's, it's a pleasure to be able to do this with everyone. And uh, we're gonna have some new folks on with us today as well. So um, what we wanna do first of all is just kind of go through some of the, the housekeeping rules, I guess you would say. Um, and for those of you that maybe aren't familiar with Zoom, we're just gonna show you a couple easy slides here before we get started. Um, what we'll be doing is we're gonna be doing a, a question and answer period. And usually we do it at the end of our webinar, but today our guest speaker, um, we're gonna actually have two question and answer periods because she's got two different sessions that she's gonna share. So we thought it'd be best to do the, the Q&A after each one. So that's kind of the way we'll proceed with that today. So if you do have questions, or even if you're thinking of questions as things are proceeding, um, just go down into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, you'll see the red arrow there and you can enter it in there. And then also we have our participants and uh, chat room. And again, uh, down at the bottom of your screen, you'll see the chat box. So you can put in the, uh, go where the red arrow is there and just type in whatever you like uh, as far as chatting. But in, before we get started with that, I guess I should just make sure that you can hear me properly. So can you just maybe type in and let us know if you're able to, to see and hear us okay? I'd hate to be talking to myself all for, yeah. for the next hour. Yeah. <laughs> ah, yeah. Well, all's good. 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 Wonderful. Thank yeah. you very much. I appreciate that. Okay. So some of the chat room rules, we'll just, uh, no soliciting in the chat room, and we'll just keep it for the comments for the guests and uh, the hosts. And then have a paper and pencil handy or a pen so you can take down some notes because I'm sure you're going to gain some valuable information. There was lots give yesterday and uh, actually all three days before there was lots of good information give. So yeah, keep a paper and pencil handy and a, a pad. So we thought, well, since we have so many new guests joining us today, we just kind of want to do a little bit of a review on who we are for those that aren't familiar with us. Uh, my name is Kelty. I'm Stan. And uh, we're back <laughs> wildlife photographers at our Back to Nature Apparel and Photography. And uh, well, we're, we're a husband and wife team. We've been together for how many years? Uh, you're kind of questioning me. 15, I know that. Put you on the spot, eh? Huh? No. Uh, we have a blended family of, of five kids, six grandkids, and some fur babies. And uh, we actually, right now, we live in Water Valley, which is uh, a little community just northwest of Calgary, about an hour. And it's, it's beautiful. We're kind of in the foothills of the Rockies, but we have a lot of wildlife in this area. So originally from Red Deer, which is about an hour and a half away, and uh, ventured out this way about 15 years ago, 15 I guess. 15 years ago. Yeah, when, uh, we got started. So, yeah, that's a little bit about... And then one of my passions is, is uh, photography, and you'll see that's where I'm out in the backyard here, which I call my backyard. It's, we got five acres of uh, forest, so it's really nice to own your own forest so you can watch everything. And then I love cooking, so that's another one of my passions. I love cooking all sorts of things. Breakfast, one of my favorites is cooking a carrot cake on the smoker barbecue. Yeah, I'm a lucky girl. <laughs> we ran a bed and breakfast for a few years, so you know who was the chef. Yeah. Um, and I myself like to, to do photography. Um, people often ask us who takes the pictures, and I, I joke and say that Stan is the addict, and actually I'm the hobbyist. So um, it, it is both of our passions. Um, I also love gardening and quilting as well. So uh, just to kind of give you a tip, uh, some ideas of what we like to do. So what makes us unique? Well, um, we are very proud to say that we're a Canadian-run family business. Uh, just Stan and myself, actually, we, we do all the work here. Um, but we are very um, adamant about wanting to support our economy and lessen the footprint on our environment. So uh, that's why I spent about a year researching when it came to putting together our unique wearable works of art, which is what we do to uh, help support wildlife rehab programs. We've taken and put our images onto uh, Canadian-made products like leggings and scarves and kimonos, um, things like that to kind of give people an idea of, you know, ways that they can reconnect with nature because we thought, you know, everybody's doing cards and prints, let's find something different. So that's how we kind of got started with our unique wearable works, we call it. Um, we also believe in giving back to nature, like I said, by supporting the wildlife rehab programs that we work with. 
and we care very deeply about helping people um, reconnect and uh, getting out in nature. These are some of the organizations that we uh, support and work with. We've worked with Medicine River. We've made a clothing line for them. We worked with the Calgary Zoo, did a clothing line for those folks. And then we've worked for with CEI. We've done uh, speaking engagements. We've done talking to camera clubs. And then we also donate our time and um, proceeds. proceeds and stuff like that. So these are some of the organizations we work with. And we're always always looking for more because we want to do what we can to, to help make a difference. And again, like you said, help people reconnect with nature. So uh, anyhow, every day we do a poll. So we just wanted to share with you uh, the results that came up from yesterday's poll. Um, yesterday we had um, Audrey and Rob on and they were sharing their information about um, iPhone photography. So we had asked, what are you uh, interested in learning? If you, oh, sorry, if you're interested in learning more about the iPhone photography and 85% said yes. So, you know, that really shows you how many people use their phones and, uh, and rightfully so. They, they've come up to such a high quality, they've really replaced a lot of the point and shoots. So also we asked if you'd be interested in learning more about printing services, because that's something that they do as well. And we've got a 65% uh, people voting yes on that one. And uh, Rob and Audrey also offer some fantastic photography adventure retreats. And 90% uh, of the people are interested in learning more about that. So it's interesting to see that people are definitely uh, know the value of nature and want to get out and uh, learn more about it. Okay, so uh, next we have uh, our Christine is our, our guest speaker today. Um, she's going to be talking on her Arctic Safari in search of the Ursus, Martimus, and the Aurora Borealis. Uh, so we're going to bring on Christine Bo Booker here from Booker Travel Adventures. And just kind of give you a little bit of information about Christine. She's an explorer at heart. Uh, she grew up in South Africa, and she loves being out in the bush, and she's very passionate about nature and wildlife conservation. And I'm sure you're going to see that in her presentation here today. So if you just bear with us for a minute, uh, we're on satellite, so we kind of have a little bit of a delay in, in switching over. So... We're going to go for that right now here. So I'm just. Oops. Okay, I'm going to unmute you, Christine, and I'm going to. I'm going to bring you, uh, turn on your video, allow you to turn your video on. I'm coming. <laughs> Wonderful. Hello. There you are. <laughs> Here I am. <laughs> Hi, Stan. Hi, Kelty. Hello. Oh, hello. How are you today? Very well, thank you. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm so excited. Well, it's great to have you. Thank you. So we're going to let Shall you... Shall I start? Yeah, we'll let yeah. you go ahead thank and we're you. just going to mute ourselves out. All righty. So I... I uh, just need you to help me share my screen, please. Okay, just a moment here, Christine. I got I got to turn you into a host. No problem. It seems I'm still a participant. Yes, yes. that's right. That's what I'm looking at here. Just gonna get you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, here it comes. Should be with you in a moment. I, I'm just gonna say hello to Bob online. Hi, Bob. Thank you for joining. Hi, Bronwyn. 
Diane Green, how nice to see you. Gail Bremer, Gail Parton. Oh, wow. Not making me nervous at all. <laughs> no pressure here. Marlene Armstrong, happy birthday. No, Maureen Donahue, happy birthday. Mommy, so lovely to see you guys. Come, welcome. And Tanya, of course. Uh, so, so wonderful to see you all on board. Thank you for joining. I hope, uh, I hope I can share something interesting for you. Okay, so uh, let me see if I can share now. And let me go from here. Uh, here we go. Great. Can you see my screen? Kelty, can you put a hands up if you can see my, my big screen? Okay, fabulous. So welcome to my armchair safari to the Canadian Arctic. Now I just have to be able to move everything out of the way here so that I can do what I have to do. Um, why doesn't my screen want to move on? Any hints or tips? Do I have to start again? Let me try this differently. Can you see me again? Okay, let me try the host. Share screen. I'll go here and I'll start this again. Great. So I am Christine Booker, the founder of Travel Booker Adventures. And what makes me unique is that I have been to the Canadian Arctic on numerous occasions, once by boat and twice on land. And apart from my native Africa, it is my favorite destination in the world. It has so much to offer, it is so grandiose. And being passionate about wildlife and conservation, as well as responsible and sustainable tourism, eco, eco tourism, it's just a destination not to be missed for any nature lover. I am a safari specialist and I design and I have for the last 40 years designed unique excursions and journeys for people who bring home the most amazing memories. And as you can see from the various certificates uh, over here, I have um, attended travel conferences all over the world where I was able to connect with industry leaders and conservationists from all walks. I've also been uh, featured in the National Geographic. Um, my, the best part of my working day is when clients come home from their trip and they tell me what they've experienced and how they've enjoyed their trip. Like Susan, who has booked three times with me and has now become a, a friend of mine. She just loves the trips that I booked for her. Uh, both these ladies are online. Thank you so much for this lovely review. Wow, 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 they say. It just makes my day. Um, I'm also a bit of a birder, although I'm terrible with bird names, but I love birds. And so I exhibited at the Ornithology Congress here in Vancouver and met some wonderful people there and was able to do a trip for them. And then, of course, I also arrange uh, journeys into the Galapagos and these people came back and said that they had the trip of a lifetime. So let's get into it. Um, some years ago, I went to the Canadian Arctic for the first time on an expedition ship, the academic Iofi, which is a Russian research vessel. 
Now, the Russians have since recalled this ship, um, <clears throat> but there are many others to choose from. This one I, I absolutely enjoyed, and I just wanted to give you an overview of where I went. So down here would be Ottawa. I flew from Vancouver to Ottawa, and then from there we flew north to Resolute Bay, which would be over here. So imagine the, the vastness of our country when you think that it takes as long to fly from Vancouver to Ottawa as it does from Ottawa to Resolute. It was a five hour flight. There we boarded our ship and we traveled along Devon Island here uh, with some stops en route, we'll go into detail, then across Lancaster Sound, which is the wildlife highway of the north. This is the entrance to the Northwest Passage. Then we wanted to go down to Pond Inlet, but as you can see here, the ice was still too solid and even though the academic Yopi is an icebreaker, it, we just couldn't get through. We had an ice captain on board and he advised us where to go and where not to go. So we wouldn't get stuck. <clears throat> we were able to go for a beautiful hike up here though. So we traveled around this island, which is a huge bird sanctuary. And we had a polar bear swim. Well, almost. <laughs> and then we entered here to Pond Inlet we were traveling at the end of August and it was the first time a ship could dock in Pond Inlet. Well, docking is saying too much because they don't have a dock. So we, we threw anchor there and we landed with our Zodiacs, but they hadn't seen people since the last September there. From there, we headed south in ba along Baffin Island into Gibbs Fjord where we were able to get off and walk on the, on the ice. That was quite exciting. And then our plan was to head east to um, Greenland. But Baffin Bay was still full of ice, as you can see here, nine tenths of ice. So we had to go north, we tried to get in. We had to go further north. So we ended up back on the 75th parallel, which is where a resolute is. And then from there, we were able to head down into Kangaluswak, um, which was our end destination, but not before stopping off in Jakobshafen, which is the, one of the fastest moving glaciers in the world and the iceberg factory of the world. So Kangaluswak is at the end of Sondrisvantrum, which is the longest fjord in the world as well. And in Kangaluswak, we flew out of an airport that used to be commissioned by the Americans during the Second, Second World War. So that was a really interesting trip. It was 1600 nautical miles and it took us 11 days. So this was our ship, the academic Yopi. Bob, I'm guessing you're back in down memory lane here. This is where Bob and I met many years ago. If you look at the ship, it's not, quite, not very small, but in comparison to the iceberg here, and then in comparison to these huge mountains, it's just a little dot in the ocean. This was one of the photos that Bob took of a young girl wearing an amalti, which is the traditional poncho that the Inuit wear. We met her on the beach in Pond, in Pond Inlet, uh, funnily enough, in Pond Inlet, I met a South African couple as well. Who knew that South Africans would travel so far? Um, they had lived there. He was working for the um, nature conservation people. They had lived there for some years, and we are still in contact now. Since then, they've moved to Iqaluit, uh, where I was able to visit with my daughter, whom I had promised a trip to the Arctic because I came, when I came back from this trip, I was so enamored, I was so excited, she said, you have to take me. So we visited them in Iqaluit. Along the trip, icebergs were amazing, and I took a thousand photographs on this trip. I didn't have a camera at that time, so these are all photographs from a, a point and shoot or from Bob's beautiful DSLR. Look at these icebergs. I mean, they, have, they come in all shapes and sizes and they are absolutely stunning. I couldn't take enough photographs of them. 
we uh, the first stop we had was in Beachy Island, which was the place where the 1840 Franklin expedition overwintered. Uh, they still have three uh, grave stones left there. I just highlighted one so that you could see it. Uh, this was a 20 year old chap, John Torrington, who didn't make it. Um, a lot of them had scurvy and so on. Uh, it was very, very tough on them. Um, and that was the ill-fated Franklin expedition. The next stop was in Dev on uh, Dundas Harbor on Devon Island, where you can see the little house in the background. Um, and imagine this was an RCMP outpost in the 1920s. They had three chaps posted there to um, protect the Northwest Passage. Now, if you live there all year long, half of the year it's pitch dark. And that little house out there is an outhouse. Now, if you gotta go and there's a polar bear, you better watch out. <laughs> Sadly, there are also three graves at this area because depression does set in and arguments and so on. So none of those guys survived. But it was a very interesting place to stop we walked around there. Before we got off, they had three scouts uh, that went off the boat first to scout out whether there were any polar bears around. They were armed guards. And once the coast was clear, we could get off and walk through the tundra there. We did see a beluga whale um, skeleton that the polar bears had brought on land and feasted on and some more icebergs. So this was during the crossing of Baffin Bay and you can see the icy bits there um, and depending on how close they are together and how deep they are you can either try and attempt to go through or you've got to go around. This was the Baylot Island Bird Sanctuary. These cliffs are a mile high and if you're sitting underneath them in your zodiac you see these birds nesting on these tiny little ledges. It was so impressive. And then of course, to top it all, this polar bear decided to go for a swim with us. And he was swimming around our zodiac. It was just so amazing. Then we went down into Gibbs Fjord. Uh, it was very misty during that time, um, but it did lighten up a little bit. And so we were able to get off the ship and do a landing on ice. And so that's where I walked on ice. That's me all wrapped up. Yes, it was a bit cool. Not as cold as Churchill, but it was cool. <laughs> and these were the sightings we had of the polar bears. One was on an ice floe. The other was on Baylot Island. And the picture in your bottom left here is of um, Pond Inlet, where the local people go out to hunt and you'll see these furs hanging outside their houses to be cured. Then this picture is of um, the uh, Jacobs, Jakobshafen ice field, that fast, blowing, fast flowing glacier that I was talking about. We rode around there in Zodiacs. It was freezing. It was like being in a freezer, but it was so beautiful. Um, the, the sites there were amazing. We landed in Greenland in both Ilulisat and in Sisimiut. Uh, the architecture and the people are completely different on the Greenland side. And I was wondering why that is. In Pond Inlet on Baffin Island on the Canadian side, you've just got a couple of houses on stilts that are government built and everything is rather depressed. This side is colorful and light and so on, and it has to do with the sea ice. So the west coast of Greenland doesn't actually um, get locked into sea ice. So they've got a thriving fishing and whaling industry all year long, and they can get out on the ice. Whereas in pond, you're locked in and you never see another person for half the year or three quarters of the year. Um, on board, we were the, the bridge was open, and here you'll see the ice captain and the expedition leader um, colluding to see what else they can show us on the next day, what the plans are for the next day. 
Um, one day they backed us up to an iceberg and we had a barbecue on the back uh, on the back deck, which was rather nice. And then we headed to Kangaluswak and off, off we went to uh, um, back home again. So that is the story of my um, Arctic expedition. And I would like to open it up to any questions if you might have. I just want to read the chat quickly and see. Kelsey, Kelty, can you unmute yourself and uh, perhaps read any questions that you have found? Sure. I'm just kind of having a look here to see what we have. Uh, okay. Um, someone want asked, how long were you there for? And how many people were on the ship? So um, I, we were on board for 11 days. The ship takes 100 passengers. And I think there were about 80 of us on board. Um, it was uh, some, of the pa some of the cabins were very, very nice. I had a cabin that I shared with another person, another lady. And we had a shared bathroom between two cabins. You also get triple cabins and quad cabins, and the quad cabins have um, uh, a bathroom shared down the hallway. Ah. Uh, someone was asking too about the clothing. How do you know what to wear and do they provide any type of Arctic clothing? <laughs> yes, that's a good question. So I had packed two suitcases. Um, and then there was a storm in Toronto and I was delayed and one of my suitcases got lost. Unfortunately, I packed one boot in one suitcase and another boot in the other suitcase. <laughs> <laughs> so I only had one boot left. Luckily, my sister lives in Toronto and she lent me her boots. She had to drive out to the airport to resupply me with everything that wasn't in the first uh, suitcase that was left, uh, that was lost. Um, they did give me a long list of equipment that I had to take. For instance, rubber gloves that are waterproof so you can hold on to the Zodiac ropes and you don't get wet hands. Um, they, most of them now supply um, rubber boots so you don't have to bring those. But we would let you know a long list, a laundry list of things that you must bring. Um, I was surprised that the days were actually quite warm. So most of my clothes were in the suitcase that were lost and I had one pair of pants and they were these, these light um, lined pants and they were good enough for me. Um, we did have, uh, um, I did have a ski suit with me so that I wore that when I went out, for instance, on the ice floe. So I brought my ski suit to keep nice and warm, but otherwise, you know, we are Canadian and we don't really need to look far before we find our warm clothes. Exactly. And, and so how cold do you, would you say it was, Christine? So um, I remember doing yoga on the top deck in Disco Bay, which is near uh, on the Greenland side, and it was eight degrees. Wow. It was always sunny. So the, the thing with the Arctic is it doesn't rain there. It, um, there's hardly any snow on the ground. It's the glaciers, it's the ice is there, um, but it hardly ever rains or snows. The problem is when you get the mist, then it becomes wet and cold. That was freezing. But while it was sunny, it was probably about eight degrees. I wasn't cold and being South African, I, I can honestly say it was fine. Ah, interesting. Um, somebody that asked too, was Resolute the dominant departure location? Say that again, please. Is Resolute the main departure location? Um, for this particular one, yes. Resolute is often the place where you will start. Um, <clears throat> some of the cruises will start in Kangaluswak and go all the way through the Northwest Passage to Copper Mine, um, Kugluk. Took, I think it's called, um, which is uh, much further west than we were. 
Um, Resolute is one of the main airports. Now Resolute, when we landed there, um, the aircraft have to be equipped with a, with a fan that uh, in front of their engines that blow the stones down because it's a dirt track. Um, so only certain aircraft can land there. And then when you do land there, they've got three guys doing the baggage handling with two pickup trucks. And they've got a small arrival slash departure hall. So when we arrived there, it was quite late in the afternoon. It was five o'clock. The wind was picking up and we were told, you better put on your, your waterproof gear before we go out onto the ship because there's no dock there. You have to climb into a Zodiac and then be driven out to the ship. So 80 of us were unpacking our suitcases and trying to find our gear. Um, some of us decided, ah, it won't be a problem. Um, I don't need this. And when they arrived on the ship, they were drenched. They were freezing. They were really sorry that they didn't do it. Um, but yes, Resolute is the one place to get from Resolute down to the ship. They had an old school bus and they were ferrying us down to, to the Zodiac Pass. They had about 20 or 30 houses in, in Resolute. It's not a very big place at all. Um, and, but lots of sled dogs all chained up. Um, I felt so bad for them. It's, uh, it breaks your heart when you see them, but that's their life, right? That's how people do it. That's, that's the way it's done. That's how they live. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. We, we had a couple more questions here. Uh, someone had asked about the whales that they hunt. Are they endangered, the ones that they hunt up there? Are they for their own purpose or are you familiar? Uh, no, usually they will hunt belugas. Um, they don't, they stay away from the narwhals, um, from the really big ones because, you know, they don't have the big whaling ships there. Um, certainly not on the Canadian side. They go out by Zodiac, so they have to take what they can carry in a Zodiac. Yeah. Um, can you give us an idea for the cost of maybe an expedition like this, Christine? Uh, yes, actually I can. So this year's expeditions have been stopped because of COVID-19. Um, so no, nothing is happening in the Arctic this year. Nature is getting a breather. Um, but these kind of trips one doesn't book um, six months in advance. You have to plan for these at least a year in advance. So this would be a good time to plan for next year's season. Um, the ships are pretty small. There's not a lot of them around. Um, there is, for instance, one um, nine day excursion that I looked at. It starts and ends in Resolute. And in a triple accommodation there, it starts at 6,300 US dollars. Um, there is another one that goes through the Northwest Passage from Greenland, Kangaluswak, all the way to Copper Mine. That's 17 days. Um, that's on the Ocean and Endeavour, and that's about nine and a half thousand US dollars. And they do have some special offers on at the moment because of COVID-19. So a lot of them have reduced their rates. Now you've got to take into consideration when you think of the, the cost of it is that um, these ships need a lot of maintenance. Mm -hmm. um, they are highly specialized ships. You often have an ice captain on board as well. Uh, and when you're on board, every bo all the crew members are specialists. So you'll have a naturalist talk. We had one chap who actually, his family was from Scotland and he had the red hair. He looked like a Viking. And he gave us a talk on animal scat one evening. That's the kind of entertainment you have on board. Um, there aren't any dancing girls. There is no casino. The food is really, really good. <coughs> um, and you have a library and you have a TV with some DVDs. And otherwise, um, you basically, your entertainment is um, being outside on deck taking photos or as I did in the end, I was talking to the birds. You probably think I'm nuts, but it was just such a spiritual experience for me. Um, and, and so, you know, that's, you're with like-minded people. People that go on these trips have been, have traveled everywhere. 
um, and are looking for an experience that just knocks your socks off. And this is it. Wonderful. Well, I have one last question here, Christine, before we move on to the next one, uh, your next presentation. Yep. Um, somebody had asked if you've ever been to the Antarctica and how it compares to that. <laughs> Actually, I have not because I'm a scaredy cat. I'm afraid of the Drake Passage, and I say it loudly and proudly. <laughs> um, just crossing uh, Lancaster Sound with a bit of a storm, I was not comfortable. Um, I mean, I used to do all sorts of things, and the older I get, the more afraid I seem to be getting of things. I do want to go to Antarctica, um, but Antarctica is more about ice and penguins and whales you don't really have the opportunity much to go on land. Uh, there isn't a tundra there. Um, so you don't see as much wildlife there as you would in the Arctic. Oh, good in my know. opinion. Yeah. Right. Oh, good, good to know. And, and just what's the approximate season dates for doing the northern voyage? The, yeah, so the season would be our summer for the Canadian Arctic and our winter for Antarctica. So that means you can go to Antarctica from September till March, and you can go to the Arctic anywhere from May, depending on how far north you want to go, um, until September. Okay, good. Okay. okay, well, maybe it's time we should move on to the, to the next venture we have. Okay, so I will share my screen again, if that's good with you. Yes, that sounds great, thanks. Excellent. And once again, it doesn't like this. So I'm going to go over here and just scroll down to where I want it to be. And come over there. We gotta love technology, eh? It is a challenge sometimes. Well, you know, if you're in a hurry, it's not the way to do it. No. Luckily, we have some time. We're in the Arctic. Uh, we're around, surrounded by COVID-19, so no one's got anywhere to go. <laughs> okay. Let's switch gears. Let's switch gears to um, Churchill in Manitoba. So this is an Inukshuk. Uh, it is the directional, traditional directional marker of the Inuit people. Um, and again, I am stuck, sorry. I don't quite know what this is. Here we are. So Churchill is the polar bear capital of the world, and surprisingly also the beluga capital of the world. It is about a thousand kilometers north of Winnipeg, which took us about four or five hours by air. And you could go by train, but that would take 45 hours. Polar bear capital of the world, as, and that's why most people go to um, Churchill, and that's why I went to Churchill. And I would consider going back in the spring or summer or fall because there are many other things to see. So when you're in Churchill, it's mainly about the, it's mainly about nature there. Um, there is, there are a couple of other things to have a look at. For instance, the Prince of Wales Fort, um, which was built in, and I have to just read this because I am not good with dates. 
Um, it was built in 1732. It took 40 years to build. Um, Churchill was basically a trading post for the Hudson's Bay Company, and it was established in 1689. But the earliest human uh, remains found there are 4,000 years old. In Churchill, you can also go to the Itzanitak Museum, um, where you will find amazing inward art um, and carvings. And I'm still kicking myself for not having brought them home from there. <clears throat> uh, in Churchill itself, there are a couple of lodges. Um, ours was rather rustic, and it had a sign on the door, don't wake me except for the northern lights. Uh, that was rather sweet. Um, this one here, the Lazy Bear Lodge, is actually built by this gentleman. It's a log cabin. It has a wonderful restaurant where they serve traditional meals um, like Arctic char and caribou. And again, my slide is stuck. So I think what I'm going to do, instead of trying the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result, I will simply go this way and we won't have the full screen. Sure, that works fine. So the, the main thing to do in Churchill, or the main time to go there if you're looking for polar bears, would be in October, November, because the polar bears migrate from inland to the coast, just waiting for a storm to bring in the sea ice so that they can go out and hunt seals. They've spent all summer on land and are now chomping at the bit uh, to get out there and to go and hunt because they are hungry. Um, to see the polar bears, one travels in these tundra buggies. They are huge and quite, quite high off the ground as you can see at the back here, I don't know if you can see my pointer now, I don't have the laser anymore. There is a open um, area at the back of the tundra buggy where you can be outside, but mostly one would be inside because it's pretty cold. Like I said, it was minus 40 plus wind chill. I, I've never been so cold in my life before, <laughs> but it was quite an experience. Unfortunately, when we got there, um, the uh, they had a storm a couple of days before, which had brought in the sea ice and taken out all the polar bears. So we did see, they told us that dot over there on the horizon was a polar bear, but even with the strongest binoculars, I still didn't believe them. Some people though are lucky and this is what they could see. That's one of the reasons you're in a, in a um, buggy in a tundra buggy which is high off the ground so that these guys can't clamber in and have you for lunch. An interesting fact about Churchill is that um, the, the unspoken law is that you're not allowed to lock your, your motor cars there. Because when a polar bear does stroll into town and they tend to do that as they are waiting on the coastline to get back out to sea, when a polar bear comes into town and finds you wandering around there at night, um, you need to be able to escape. So if there's a car around, you just hop into that car and lock the doors. Now, this polar bear that might have walked into town is then going to be captured. And instead of them putting them down, they put them into this holding facility or a polar bear jail, as it's also known. The polar bears are locked up there for 30 days without food in a dark place um, so that they realize that coming into town is not going to be a picnic and that they hopefully learn their lesson and don't come back again. After the 30 days, they are released back into the wilderness, hopefully never to be seen again. Another interesting thing to do in Churchill would be to go dog sledding. There is a character over there. He's called Dan. He's also got Dan's Diner. Uh, people fly into Dan's Diner just to see the Northern Lights and to go onto one of these dog sled runs. 
And if you remember at the beginning of my presentation, I actually got a certificate. Uh, he's got a great sense of humor. And instead of doing the, I did a rod, I did a mile um, is my certificate. I did a mile on a dog sled. And that was wonderful. The sunsets that you see over there are out of this world. Uh, the scenery is just beautiful. And then at night, if it's clear, you see those northern lights. They are absolutely stunning. I, I couldn't believe. So it was so in this little hotel that we were staying in, as I said, there was a sign on the door, wake me for the northern lights. And by goodness, there was a knock on the door and out we went off to some, I don't know, somewhere in the middle of nowhere. And they started dancing. These, these northern lights just dance across the sky. It doesn't matter how cold you are, you're just mesmerized by this spectacle. It is, it is really worth going to um, see the Northern Lights. Now, the best place to see the Northern Lights in the world is actually Yellowknife, um, where they almost guarantee you seeing the, no Northern, the Northern Lights. Churchill, not so much because they often have inclement weather. Um, but the most interesting place to see the Northern Lights would be Whitehorse, because in Whitehorse, you can also do other things like ice fishing or dog sledding or um, I've written them down here. Um, anyway, so there's, there's a lot of things to do in Whitehorse that isn't really on offer in Yellowknife. So if you just want to go for the Northern Lights, Whitehorse would be the place to go. And then Churchill, of course, is not only for polar bears. These are pictures that Kelty lent me, thank you very much, of what I call the Parmesan, or actually it's called the ta 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 help me out here, camera, <laughs> Kelty. It's a ptarmigan. <laughs> the name of this bird? Yeah, it's Say a ptarmigan. Yeah, a ptarmigan? Yeah, a ptarmigan. Of course, it's a ptarmigan. And he's, he's, just um, going, he's going between seasons right now, so that's why he has still a little bit of brown feathers, so he's just going into his winter. Okay. <laughs> and you took these photographs in October, right? Yes, yes. yeah, middle of October. Yes. So you can see the difference in season. I went at the beginning of November and I, all I saw was snow and ice and you still had uh, open ground there. So it really every year is different and it depends on when you go. Um, there's an Arctic fox there. And if you are birders, uh, um, Churchill is amazing for birds. In the summer, uh, the height of the summer, so June, July, you can see up to 50, 150 species of birds there. But of course, we go for the polar bears. And even in the summer, you can have some beautiful polar bear sightings and in the spring and in the fall. Now, if you are a photographer and you want to see polar bears not from the top of these tundra buggies, there are some lodges north of Churchill. They are actually unique lodges of the world. There are three of them. The most popular is uh, Seal River and Nanook Lodge. And you can actually go for walks there with, of course, an armed guard um, to see and experience polar bears relatively up close. Um, it, it is an exciting way of seeing things. Those lodges are fenced and sometimes you will have a polar bear come up to the fence. The food there is amazing. Um, in order to uh, have the designation of a unique lodge of the world, you need to have great food, great accommodations and fabulous guides and of course be in a location that is like no other. And so that would be um, north of Churchill, you actually take a float plane up into these little lodges. And that is the end of my story about Churchill. Thank you so, so much, Kelty and Stan, for inviting me to share my passion about the Canadian Arctic. I love sharing that, um, and I really appreciate it.
Well, now you want us to go back again. So <laughs> you're, you put the desire. To <laughs> Find a way to go somewhere again. I'd love to go see one of them. Yeah. Yeah. I love to walk with the polar bears. Done uh, grizzly. Uh, yes, I, I would also like to walk with the polar bears, but I think I would like a, to have a, an anti-polar bear net on me so that they don't attack me. <laughs> That's called the cave. <laughs> Okay, I'm, I'm just going to check here for questions to see if there's any uh, any questions coming up. Um, someone had asked about, do you know, um, as far as food and stuff like that on any of these tours, do they cater to vegetarians and people with special eating situations? Uh, they would cater to vegetarians, but I think you wouldn't have a lot of variety. Um, however, these trips are usually only three or four days long. So you and you're traveling within Canada. So if there is something that you really enjoy, you could probably pack it in your bag and add that to um, the salad or the soup or whatever you, they might serve you. I can't imagine that they have a lot of variety there. But the unique lodges of the world, absolutely, they would cater for anybody. Now on that point, um, if you are in any way, if you are um, disabled from a walking point of view, this would not be the destination for you because you have to climb into these tundra buggies. So even if you have a walker or you're in a wheelchair, walking sticks, yes, not a problem, but you have to be able to climb some stairs. <laughs> yes. And then kids, kids under seven is not recommended. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know when we because went, you said, sorry when, when we, yeah when we did the polar bears and we went on the tundra buggies like you said it's it's a long set of stairs up to the platform then they on the platform then you are level with the tundra buggies and you can venture into the tundra buggies but like you said yeah there's no there's no handicap access in that same case no, nothing nothing like that no, no. It's, it's a very short time period so what so what what is the time period specifically for the polar bears up there. Uh, only October, November, probably a month, probably four weeks. So middle of October to middle of November, but you know, our weather uh, changes so much. I see here a question, how long was I there? I think we were there for three nights. Right, yeah, yeah. And I, I have heard about excursions where you can fly in for one day, but I know our guide said they didn't recommend it because it's just so iffy with the weather. It's iffy with the weather and iffy with the with the bears. I mean, they don't line them up for you. No. Darn it. Well, and the other thing is, <laughs> Gone. If, if I go on the three-day excursions and stuff like that, at least you get to experience the town a little bit and go to the museum, go to exactly. the sledding. Yeah. You get to do a little bit more than just the polar bears. So that's the nice thing about it. Yeah. 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 And the there is one, there is one um, lodging. It's called the Tundra Buggy Lodge. Yeah which is actually out on the tundra. Um, so it's a bunch of tundra buggies all put together. One of them is a kitchen, one of them is a lounge car, one of them is a dining car, and two of them are sleeping cars. And then all you would do is look for polar bears. Um, that to me, I, 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 you know, everybody has different tastes, but to me that's a rather one-sided way of looking at things. Mm -hmm. Yes, and it, and I've seen the inside of the lodge, those tundra buggies, and they are like it's like bunk beds, and so <laughs> you have you have to have hearing aids or I mean uh, hearing plugs, earplugs. Yeah. That's for yeah. sure. And, yeah. and the bunk beds only have a curtain in front of them, so there's no privacy. Yes. Nope. Yeah. Okay, so you get you get very cozy with your with your fellow travelers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so Christine, somebody had asked about um, with the with the cubs merging in the in the. February and March like that. Is there a chance to arrange a trip during that time period? I beg your pardon again? When the cubs start to come out, like in, in the January to March, when the cubs start merging, can you arrange a trip in that time period? Um, I can arrange anything. I mean, I've arranged seats for Wimbledon tennis finals behind the Royal box. Uh -oh. I can do anything. Uh -oh. um, and and um, there's a reason why they don't go at that time of the year. Uh, it's probably quite dark because of the latitude. 
Um, and also bears are aggressive enough without having their cubs around. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine that you would be able to get very close to a polar bear if she's got young cubs. Yes, yes. And, mm -hmm. and like you said, the lighting, my gosh, you would only have maybe a couple hours of light. In yeah, the, the other thing you've got to consider, um, Kelty and Stan, is that in the winter, they are not on land. They're out on the ice. Yeah, right. well, these would be and the so we can't actually get to them. Gotcha. Yeah. Right. So the newborns usually come out about March. There is some trips into there about that time. But yeah, they have, they send guides out looking for uh, they send the guides out looking for um, breath coming out of the ground. They can see steam. Yeah. They know that's where the den yeah. is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But mm. I don't know how much daylight they have or anything like that. I've never really looked into it, but well, that's another trip. I don't know what the latitude is, but it can't be much. It can't be much. No, no, exactly. So because it's salt of Churchill where that is, that's in Wapask, I think they call it, uh, yeah. National Park. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm just going to look and see. Do we have any more questions here? Um, somebody, somebody asked about kids over seventy. <laughs> Absolutely. <think> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's no upper age limit. Um, I have a, a nanogenarian right now who's very fit um, and who wants to travel. And, you know, it depends on your fitness level, really. The right. kids under seven is because you spend all day in this, in this tundra buggy. People have spent a lot of money to go there and you don't want a screaming kid ruining your day. Yeah, yeah. I know somebody had asked too about the train trip from Winnipeg to Churchill, what it was like. I know Tanya said it was pretty phenomenal. Have you uh, experienced that at all or heard anything, Christine? I, I haven't experienced it. And if you have the time, um, it, it could be a very, very interesting trip, no doubt. Yeah, somebody said it's But it is 45 hours. Yes, 45 hours. Interesting. That is a long and, trip. And you're not going very far in those, it's a thousand kilometers. And it's 45 hours so you are going really slowly and if you can do that <laughs> perfect i can't <laughs> oh well that was great well thank you christine what a fantastic presentation i know you certainly uh tweaked my husband's interest yeah, once again sure. as as quite a few i see in our in our chat room so uh yeah that, that's been fantastic i really appreciate you coming on thank you Thank you so much. And, and I just wanted to give you guys a little bit of a plug. I mean, I just got the scarf from Kelty and Stan. Can you see it? With this beautiful picture of an owl, which you took, right? Yeah. And then you, then you put these, your photographs, you put them onto these gorgeous pieces of material. This one happens to be a scarf. Mm -hmm. Very soft, very nice. I treasure it. And it's made in Canada, and it's got your own picture on it. And I can't imagine a better gift to give anybody. Thank you so, so much. It's beautiful. Well, thank Wonderful. you. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Well, it was a pleasure having you. Um, may I offer one more thing, Kelty? Yes. Um, I was thinking, if anybody wants to learn more about this, in your, in your vault tomorrow, I was thinking of putting an offer of a discovery call so that people can have a phone call with me, a one-on-one -on -one phone call, and we can talk about what might be possible and what their interests are, and perhaps create a bucket list vision board for a trip within Canada. Okay. Oh, that sounds okay. wonderful. That is great. Well, thank you. Well, I guess I should get you to switch me back over to the host so we can do our quick little poll today. Uh, tell me how, and I will... Okay, if you go to our name, go into the panelists and you go to our name. Ah, yes, I remember now. We have to um, I remember and the more make host. Look at that. Such a clever child. <laughs> well, four days now we're getting to be good at it. Well, <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Touch wood. <laughs> Okay. Okay, so we are back to host now. Sure Wonderful. Okay. Uh, yep. Okay. So I'm just gonna go back and share our screen. Ah, so there we are. 
Okay. Okay. So right now we, as every do every day, we have a little poll that we're going to put up there for you. So if you wouldn't mind taking a few minutes, um, here it is here today. So feel free to fill that in for us, and it'll help Christine with some information as well as ourselves. Lots of information there that Christine shared with us today, and uh, mm -hmm. boy, does that make you want to go. I know it's like one person had commented that, you know, who needs to leave Canada when we have so much, uh, so many beautiful things to see here right in our own backyard. Yeah, it's got my bucket list filling up some more. <laughs> okay. Are you able to do that poll there? Somebody's voted. Oh, there it came through. No, it's, oh, it's just taking a few minutes for that poll to kick in here. So great. Well, thank you folks for for commenting and entering into that. Just give you a few more seconds here. Okay, so we're going to end the poll here, and thank you again. Okay. And so anyhow, just a little bit about tomorrow. Tomorrow is going to be our final day, and with that we have Carol Kelly from coming on from the Medicine River Wildlife Center. Carol is the director and founder of this amazing facility, and she's got some very interesting uh, information and stories to share with you on that. So we hope you'll come back and join us tomorrow. So um, share with all your friends and family and put it on social media for us and let's have some more people come out and enjoy what we have to offer about nature. And so with that, we uh, just wanted to remind you that tomorrow too, uh, as our thanks to you, we'll, we'll be offering our virtual travel pack, as Christine was talking about. She's going to have some information in there for you. And as of all of our guests this week, everybody's putting a little bit into that travel pack. So we, uh, we hope you'll be here to join us so that you can take advantage of that. And we're also going to have a, a special announcement tomorrow as well uh, with what has been happening during this week here. So thanks once again, everybody. We've enjoyed having you and we look forward to having you back again tomorrow. Bye for now. Have a great day, everybody. Bye for now.